My name is Ella Whelan. I am a columnist at the online magazine Spiked, and I'm also a producer at the Battle of Ideas, the Academy of Ideas. I'm hosting this strand. It's called Identity Wars, Feminism Post Me Too. And I have to admit, this is the debate that I centered the strand on. What is a woman anyway? Because I am infinitely fascinated by the discussion about women, woman, womanhood, uh, many people will have seen the news about the WOMXN scandal or fury or mess or whatever you want to call it in relation to the Wellcome Trust. Not least discussions about the Gender Recognition Act, what defines a woman, how women can be defined, whether or not women, cis women, should be able to set the definition for what women are. All of that is uh, in relation to the trans discussion is so infinitely fascinating and I'm really delighted that we're going to have this. I don't use the word safe space ever really, but I'm saying that this is going to be a relatively safe space to talk about some of those um, interesting and difficult ideas. But also, also not just in relation to trans, I think the discussion about women, what it means to be a woman, what it means to be a good woman today is also interesting. So you have discussions within feminism about what it means to be a good feminist and therefore a, a good woman. It means shunning things like page three and it means celebrating things like free the nipple. There's you know, weird contradictions within what constitutes being a woman. Um, discussions about sex, women's role in the workplace, women's role in the home. All of this seems to be sort of up for grabs. And at speaking as a woman, which is also something I don't necessarily like saying, um, I have to admit that I've never really thought about this before in my 26 years. And suddenly I'm being forced to confront what I think it means to be a woman. And I'm not sure that I either have the answer or want to give an answer, but I certainly want to talk about it. And I have a fantastic panel today to help me do so. First to speak will be Heather Brunskill Evans, who is an academic and a writer and is co editor of Transgender Children and Young People. And many of you will know that Heather has run into, let's say, some obstacles in talking about this subject, has been barred from speaking at many meetings. We certainly wanted to get her to give her opinion on what it means to be a woman today. Next up will be Chrissy Daz, who is a school teacher, a cabaret performer, and an author on transgender and gender variant identity. Next will be Cathy Gagnall. Gingell. Gingell, there we go. Gingell, who is uh, the co-editor of The Conservative Woman, uh, writes a lot about womanhood, uh, feminism, abortion, lots of issues in relation to that. And last but not least is Joanna Williams, who is the head of education and culture at the Policy Exchange and the author of the very influential book, Women Versus Feminism. She's also the associate editor at Spiked. So we're going to do this in the sort of traditional BOI format. We will have introductions from our speakers and then we're going to go straight out to you guys for contributions and questions. So without further ado, Heather, can you kick me off? Okay, um, I've just got a very strict seven minutes, which I'm going to find it very difficult to comply with. I just want to say that for the first time, I've actually come to a meeting where there hasn't been a group of trans activists outside attempting to stop me from going in and shouting at me, trans women are women, trans women are women. So um, I think that a woman, when we, throughout history, the woman question has always been asked, and it's always been asked in relation to men, what are women um, in relation to men? And it's usually that men tell women who they are and have been doing so since the beginning of recorded history. And I'm putting the um, trans men uh, who identify as women shouting at me that trans women are women into the category of men who continually who continue the tradition of telling women who they are, how they should think about their bodies, etc. So just a little bit of brief academic stuff because I can't resist it. Um, men have attributed to themselves the prototype of what it is to be human, positioning themselves, positioning women as their inferior other. Religion, evolutionary biology and medicine have all attributed women's inferior status to her defective body or biology rather than to the political organisation of women as a sex class. So notable women throughout the centuries have dared to resist this masculinist um, definition of women's bodies. Um, they've argued that gender identity is a product of culture, not of nature. 
and they've separated biological sex from social gender. When you do that, when you separate out gender and sex instead of using them as interchangeable concepts, then gender is a social product and the politics of gender identity become much more clear. So this, uh, um, women have done this, as I said, through the centuries. It's an epistemological and a political move. There's an attempt to reframe theories, models of sex, gender, and human nature, indeed. Now, um, this move was not intended to dispense with material reality, but in the 19, um, broadly speaking, the, the 1980s perhaps, increasing in strength during the 1990s, post-structuralism and post-modernism and queer theory developed the idea of social constructionism beyond the point at which we could look at the social construction of the body and began to dispense with any notion of the body whatsoever. So they developed it far more than a feminist materialist intention. And transgender ideology is the casualty of this. Ironically, transgender ideology doesn't dispense with biological essentialism, but in fact, it reifies it. It simply reverses the order so that gender identity becomes inherent and fixed and unmovable, and somehow binary sex categorization is allegedly socially constructed. Uh, this has no scientific basis whatsoever um, and compels a kind of religious faith belief in things like the pink brain, the blue brain, don't tell me how much longer I've got, right, okay. <laughs> and this idea of inherent gender identity is the very thing that has policed women through the centuries. So strangely, in the year when we celebrate the centenary of women's vote, we actively silence women from defining their own bodies. So when the dictionary definition of woman is put on tiny stickers, or a statement uttered that human beings in possession of penises are male, the police investigate women who say such things for hate speech and, and do far worse things to them, actually. Women are threatened, uh, and indeed men too, who support the feminist um, argument threatened in their jobs and so on, but I don't need to explain that to people here. So, I answer the question, a woman is sexed female. Our sex was not assigned at birth, it was empirically observed. My body is a material reality through which I have loved, given birth four times, fed babies, and have had some sexual pleasure. <laughs> <laughs> You'd be pleased to know. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> I thought I would give a positive um, um, interjection of my own materiality rather than um, a negative one, which, okay, I'll answer questions about that later, no doubt. <laughs> Not too many personal ones, please. Mm. Okay. So, to end, I want to say, thank you, Ella. Is it possible for us to be grown up and hold in our minds two ideas, namely, that instead of the dichotomy nature or nurture, we can think of the body as both a material reality, but one inevitably lived through cultural constructions and power relations? Thank you very much, Helen. <laughs> Chris. Okay. Uh, I want to start by talking a little bit about the experience of trans people, which we do hear a lot about. Um, we could go through a whole list of hardships uh, that are suffered, physical sexual assaults, family rejection, religious persecution, homelessness, discrimination, and various forms of self-harm. Now, it is, uh, to begin with, um, awkward. I, I was looking for some... Uh, statistics to possibly bring along, but it's very difficult because a lot of it is self-reporting um, and it is quite also very difficult to disentangle uh, 
where the cause of particular hardships might come from. So, for instance, it is true, I think, that in most of those areas, trans people are at a disadvantage socially, but how much of that is to do with the fact that they have to invest time, effort and money into going through transition? Um, that sort of thing. But what I would like to, to say is that whatever these the hardships that trans people suffer, and I, I think a lot of it is social, but certainly historically there was a lot of um, antagonism towards such people, but I don't think any of it has got anything to do with how they say that they are. So in other words, um, I was listening to a, a, an interview with Paris Lees yesterday, and she seems absolutely lovely. Uh, and she was talking about her childhood and all of the abuse, all of the, um, the, 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 the self-doubt that she suffered from throughout that. Um, and at the end of it, I thought, you know, she would have gone through exactly the same experience if she had come out at the end of that and decided to be a gay man, as, uh, as, as she did um, anyway. Also, there are certain senses in which the new... Um, definition and ideology of what transgender means actually end up excluding people who would otherwise be considered as transgender. Most obvious examples, Glasgow Pride, which 2015 and this year have excluded drag queens from taking part in that. Other Pride events have sort of relegated drag queens. Um, you can be within the trans umbrella if you identify as a woman once every Tuesday or every other Tuesday, that's fine. <laughs> but you have to buy into the three bits of the philosophy. Basically, that feeling that you are a woman means you are one. Um, other people have to accept that. If they don't accept that, or even if they just question that, they are accused then of trying to make you not a person, which I don't think follows at, uh, at all. Um, how long have I got? Another four minutes. OK, um, so to answer the question, are trans women women, I want to um, think about four ways in which we can um, think about how to get to the truth of that matter. The one will be the law. Now, generally speaking, I think that it is best when the law does as little of, as possible, specifically, especially in terms of deciding what is and what isn't true. Um, but when we, when we take this this particular question, before 1970, it was, the law had no opinion on it. There were men who had transitioned, who'd become women, who lived as women. Uh, they could get married, they could informally go, uh, go about having documents changed, that sort of things. In 1970, in Britain, um, April Ashley brought, well, it wasn't her, actually, her husband uh, brought a, uh, uh, the case to the law courts. Uh, wanted to get the marriage annulled and the judge decided that actually a man cannot become a woman. So the law then said from 1970 um, a man cannot be a woman and all transsexual women were men according to the law. Till 19, sorry, till 2004 the Gender Recognition Act changed all that but it didn't just mean that transsexual women who did everything that they could to be as women to blend in and, and, uh, and uh, live as women, the law as it currently stands does state that as long as you fulfill the criteria, you show that you intend to live the rest of your life, you go through two years, etc., etc., that at the end of that you can be legally classified as a woman without actually having anything, without actually sh demonstrating that in any ways um, at all, which give, brings us an interesting anomaly where Paris Lees, who has transitioned fully, who would be um, easily mistaken as a woman, um, isn't a woman legally because she hasn't got a Gender Recognition Act, whereas someone like Alex Drummond, who initially went through that process and then decided it's just going to wear a full beard, a little bit of eye makeup, pearls, but he is legally a woman. Okay, I think that causes a lot of confusion for ordinary people. Uh, the second um, way of deciding the truth is science, so biology. I don't want to spend too much on this, it's a huge subject, but I just want to pick up on a couple of things. First of all, there are anomalies. Sex is not, doesn't have sharp edges. There are 
some anomalies. There are um, people born with male chromosomes and testes, but to all uh, appearances are women, are brought up as women. Sometimes they do have uh, ambiguous traits, sometimes those traits change during adolescence. But that doesn't mean, as many people say, that we have a gender spectrum. Ge uh, spectrum looks like that. <coughs> okay, you've got <coughs> clear stages going from blue to pink. <coughs> the biological facts looks more like that. There's a little strip down the middle. Okay, so <laughs> biologically speaking, that's what, it, that's what that amounts to. Uh, also, the brain, there is no such thing as a female brain. Brains are, are mosaics. Um, and hence, I'll have to speed up, I haven't got much time. Um, yeah, I'll just skip that one and come back to it. <laughs> Two other ways of deciding the truth. Again, I'm just going to mention them because I'm running out of time. Personal conviction, but I think that runs throughout the whole of this discussion, so I don't need to say more on that specifically. And common experience, how we normally experience things. And I think there is an enormous amount of goodwill in society that if someone demonstrates that they want to live this way, most of us, most of the time, are completely fine with that and don't have a problem. So to conclude then, I think there has to be a bottom line, and this is f um, because of what feminism managed to achieve. In the 1970s, I think one of the greatest things that feminism did was that it's established that you, as a woman, can do anything you like. You can dress how you want, you can go after any sort of job, behave as you want, you can be lesbian. None of that makes you any less a woman. That was not the case before that time. Before that time, if you behaved in a less feminine way, you were considered less of a woman. If you take that logic, which is a victory, as I say, I think it's, it's empowered women, if you take that logic and, and apply that to trans women, you logically you end up with someone that just says, well, actually, I think I, I am a woman. And, and that doesn't fit. It basically, that's, that's anomalous with common sense, with the, uh, and it, 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 it undermines the cohesion and the goodwill which have been built up hitherto. Um, also, one final point Briefly. is that <laughs> there is a similarity, I think, in this argument that what I say is the truth with the I believe her hashtag. Mm. In other words, it is no longer the case, or that's the threat, it's no longer the case that we interrogate, find out the truth through looking at evidence, through arguing, debating, uh, and, and, and even coming into conflict. We just simply have to take it on trust, and then it depends who it is that you trust, because uh, how otherwise are you supposed to work out contending claims? Thank you, Christy. <laughs>
the feminist legacy that all we're left with as a woman is a body-based identity up for grabs for anyone to appropriate at will. After the pain, risk and death of thousands of years of childbirth, We couldn't have asked such questions 50 years ago when mothers, matrons and matriarchs were still respected, the linchpins of their families and the community. But women's lib put paid to that. Radical feminists weren't just disinterested in the family and women's roles there, they were positively hostile to it. The more they could make women like men, the closer they thought they'd be to equality. It was an idea destined to fail, but it's an idea that shaped everything since. All that's mattered since is the public sphere, and the only status that matters for women is work. Women's commitment to relationships, to family, to child rearing, have been subordinated to the male obsession, work. Sexual differences have had to be denied or suppressed. It was only when I gave birth and had my babies that the sort of full force of this craziness came upon me. And I realised that the urgency of what I needed and wanted to do had no status, that role that I wanted, and that I'd become a second-class citizen. Motherhood was a stigmatised role. Since then, the direction of travel has been one way, to work. And nothing now less than parity, absolute parity will do. And Mrs May is very on board with enforcing this. That's though changes to family life have been quite revolutionary. Huge numbers are made by, led by state-dependent single mothers. Outsourced childcare is the norm. And its hidden costs completely ignored. Now more calamities loom. There's male alienation. There are a lot of men going their own way. There's a widening chasm between the sexes. Most young girls must realise this. And for more and more young women, single and childless futures await them. And that's a fact. It's a statistical fact. This is the mess that fanatical feminism has got us into. Stripping us of our life and relationships Women are becoming little more than economic cogs on a lonely work treadmill. That's the prospect for their future. Now, to top it all, what's left of womanhood has been reduced to a victim status. If you believe me too, we now have no agency at all. Women like Ella, Joanna, me, Heather. It's embarrassing. But it's terrible for men too, because they've been branded as me too misogynist male rapists. It's ridiculous. Men are not like that as a class any more than women are nymphomaniacs as a class. So, where are we with feminism? This happens to be the patriarchy victim narrative that's the basis for feminist resistance to transgender identification. <coughs> that they'll be assaulted, fundamentally. For decades, they've been insisting that men and women were the same and interchangeable. Now the transgenders have taken them at their word. Now, they say they're not. Well, it's ground zero moment for feminism. Feminist chickens have come home to roost. Are we the same or aren't we? You can't have it both ways. And that's what comes, in my view, of devaluing motherhood. Feminists need not fear. Womanhood does not mean women can't work. They always have. Or that women must have children. But it does mean that the category of women as a whole must have children. Women do this in order for us to survive. Oh, sorry. I'm nearly there. It is the one thing that men can't do, have children. It's our trump card. Why would we throw it away? Why would we devalue it? The feminist attempt to denigrate motherhood has denigrated women. Because most women still put a high value on relationships and having and raising children. Nearly half women give their primary identity as mother, wife or partner over their occupation or their public role. Mothers want to be able to prioritise their role in the family. Ideally, they want to work part-time with their man working full-time. 
NetMum survey just said a few years ago that feminism's biggest fight now was to reinstate the value of motherhood. Women like investing in relationships, in loving and caring. They're good at it. They want and have to bring up children. And, wom and womanhood needs it and society needs it. So my final point is, what better defence as women do we have against the fantasy that a man has the right to become a woman as a matter of choice than this, our womanhood? Okay. Joanna. If somebody had said to me even 10 years ago, I would be taking part in a debate, uh, the title of which was, What is a Woman? I would have been completely nonplussed. I would have thought this is like the most bizarre thing. Why are we having a debate about what is a woman? And I think I would have genuinely struggled to answer the question because when you move away from basic elements of biology and you don't resort to stereotypes in relation to dress and makeup and appearance, um, and you try and think, what, what does it feel like to be a woman? It's actually, I think, impossible to answer that question. There isn't a kind of essence of womanhood that comes from inside, just as I don't think there's an essence of manhood um, that comes from inside. So to, to try and actually verbalise what it means to be a woman, I think is a very difficult thing to do. Um, but, but, you know, in, in a very short space of time, then I would say in, in the space of 10 years, probably even five years, not only has it become necessary to start answering these questions, but as nobody in this room needs me to tell them it's actually become an incredibly controversial uh, topic as well. Um, this time yesterday I was in Edinburgh in the Scottish Parliament and I was taking part in a debate on Me Too, uh, where next for Me Too, and I don't think it's much of an exaggeration to say that in opposing Me Too and challenging the direction of the Me Too movement, um, I was in a minority of one, um, including everybody in the audience and everybody on the panel, and you could see the more I was vocalising criticisms with the direction of the Me Too movement, the more people were getting kind of a bit agitated and a bit cross with me. Um, but I actually only got a real audible, horrified gasp at one thing. And somebody in the audience asked the question, um, what did I think about all women shortlists for Parliament? And I said, you know, actually, I think all women shortlists are a really bad idea. And I gave my reasons. But I said, actually, I'm really pleased that we're at least discussing discussing all women shortlist because I'd far rather challenge all women shortlist politically um, than erode all women shortlist by redefining what it means to be a woman and by having men identify as women making their way onto all, sh all women shortlist. And that was the point at which everybody <laughs> uh, completely erupted. That's the boundary. <laughs> That's what you're not allowed to say nowadays. Um, the, the whole conversation around what does it mean to be a woman, I've got to confess, really depresses me because on the one hand from transgender activists, to be a woman is, is literally nothing. It's, it's literally the word has been eroded. It's reduced to insignificance. It's, it's erased. Um, it's reduced to a passing feeling, as, as people have said, as Chrissy said, you know, that you can have on some days, not others. And I think this is bad. Um, it's bad because it erodes women from public life. Um, it, I think it's a very conservative, and I mean that with a small c, as, as Cathy's pointed out, Theresa May and the Conservative Party are at the forefront of championing much of this legislation. But I think it's very conservative with a small c because I think it does reinforce an awful lot of gender stereotypes. It um, entrenches the idea that to be female is to wear a dress and like makeup and behave in a very feminine way manner when I was growing up, you know, I wanted to challenge all of that. I didn't want to be that kind of stereotypical princessy kind of girl. Um, but I, I can honestly say I didn't think challenging that feminine, that, that very overt kind of feminine stereotype made me any, any less of a girl. I was fully aware that I was female, that I was a girl, but I just wanted to wear trousers and do everything that boys did. And, and I think the transgender ideology is really in danger of entrenching some, some uh, stereotypes. Um, 
So I think transgenderism is, is essentially very conservative, but it appears as if it's it's very liberal, um, a very radical um, challenge to past assumptions. And yet it's being reinforced, as we see every day now, through intimidation, through censorship, and ultimately even we've seen examples of it being reinforced through violence. So I think it's an incredibly um, difficult, I'm, I'm wanting to say the word problematic, but <laughs> I'm kind of shying away from that. I, mean, I think it's a movement with a lot of problems for those reasons. But on the other hand, the other reason why I find this whole debate a bit depressing, and this is where I do agree with some of the latter points that, that Cathy was making, was because a lot of the opposition to <coughs> transgenderism um, centers around this idea that to be a woman is to suffer. To be a woman is to suffer at the hands of men. It's to be um, subject to violence, to abuse, to discrimination, and that women need to have defended women-only spaces um, because um, men will be lurking on every street corner, kind of out to, to get us. And, you know, obviously I'm not deny, I'm not so completely naive as to deny, I mean, there have been some terrible examples of transgender uh, men, uh, not transgender men, sorry, men becoming women who have transitioned to become women who are then um, in women-only prisons. And we've seen what's happened there, you know, so I'm, I'm not saying we we should just there's, there's nothing here at all but i think a definition of womanhood that does center victimhood first and foremost that does suggest that to be a woman is to um, be oppressed to need special treatment um, is a bad starting point for this debate so if i one minute left if i was going to answer this question what is a woman anyway um, i would start with biology um, i would definitely say that to be a woman is a lot more than a feeling but it's it's also more than biology itself because i think ultimately what a woman is is what what the woman herself makes it it's what she makes it to be so i don't think women are victims of men but neither do i think that women are victims of their hormones or a product of simply their hormones or their genetics either we should be able to wear what we want do what we want say what we want mix with whoever we want go wherever we want um, but that means seeing ourselves not as a product um, of simply our biology, not as a victim of our circumstances, a victim of, of men, um, but an agent, an agent who is in control of our own destiny, who's able to override biology and override um, this, what we're told are the circumstances that we exist in to make our own way in the world. And just very, very final point, at the end of the debate on um, Me Too that I was speaking in yesterday, um, I have to confess, a very tiny group of people came up to me at the end to say thank you, really enjoyed that. Um, one of whom was transgender, a transgender man. He said, I thought that was absolutely fascinating, really enjoyed it. Uh, he said, and it's just worth bearing in mind, and I think this is a really important point, that the transgender community is not a homogenous group. And there's a lot of people from inside the transgender community who are actually very uncomfortable themselves about the direction in uh, which th this debate so often seems to head. Okay, thank you, Joanna. Okay, let's have your hands up for some contributions. I'd like to question the fact that the underval undervaluing of femininity is a product of feminism, and I'd say rather it dates back to kind of patriarchal times where actually women's nature was put down to you know, um, ungodliness as a divine punishment, you know, the days of Christine de Pizan and um, the book of the City of Ladies, I'd say that it's actually feminism's job to take back what it is to be a woman and to put value back on that rather than kind of as a reaction to patri patriarchy telling us that we don't have decent qualities. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I work in uh, reproductive um, medicine and genetics. And I wanted to just look at the question that if you want to define biologically what a woman is or what a female is, and I know that's not the only way you can try and answer that question, then, then how would you go about it? I think the most coherent answer to that question, and keep in mind that on Thursday, Chinese scientists for the first time created mammals with two parents of the same sex. They were mice. Um, 
But the, the most coherent way to do it is not necessarily to talk about the chromosomes. Uh, there, there is a gene on one of the sex chromosomes that initiates a process of sex differentiation in males, but it doesn't complete or conclude that process. And although it does usually happen a certain way, uh, it doesn't always, and that's what results in that admittedly narrow strip of people with ambiguous uh, or anomalous sexual and genetic characteristics that, uh, that Chrissy showed in the diagram. The best way to do it, and it sounds horribly clinical, uh, is to say that the female um, is, is the person with the app an, an apparatus, a biological apparatus, functioning or otherwise, uh, with which a pregnancy could be born. I think that is the most coherent uh, biological definition of a female. And it prompts a political uh, question, which is one of the things I do in my job is, is sort of um, explore the law and the ethics and the politics of non-traditional family groups and how their interests might be served and whether or not they're legitimate and so on and so forth. And um, it raises the question of when you have a non-traditional family form where it's not necessarily the birth mother who is the parent or the automatic parent or the one of two parents who happens to be female, does that leave people in a more vulnerable position? Women specifically, perhaps, in relation to the family as it's changing and evolving. Sorry. I, you know, I identify as a, a feminine person, a woman, and I think that by defining myself as a vagina and a womb is more derogatory than cis, you know, than people with male bodies defining themselves as feminine. And I think that the fact that... I think that there's always been a concept of being a, tr a trans woman, if you will. The Native American people, they have the concept of two-spirit, um, which is, if you like, kind of an older version of the LGBT plus community, where they identify with gender freely and it isn't restricted to a set of organs. And to me, I think that if people choose to define me as literally just a womb, it's far more derogatory than anything that a trans woman could ever want to be defined as. And typically with, I think the point was brought up about trans women like wearing makeup and kind of like, you know, typically effeminate clothing. It's because we, we do live in a society where women are defined by that and that isn't their fault. It isn't their problem. They're just essentially just trying to fit with the main status quo of what women should look like. So they're not penalized by everyone else. Hi, um, I wonder how much the, this obsession with the transgender debate is um, part of a wider assault on masculinity. Um, if we regard gender as being on a spectrum and totally fluid, then we can do away with what it means to be female, what it means to be male, and ultimately socialize men into becoming less masculine or less toxic. Some people see it. Just following on from what she said, I think there's also a bit of a misunderstanding about the feminist movement. Because additionally to not defining women by their organs, um, some women can't have children, and that doesn't mean they're not women. That's a lot of women. So I don't, I really don't understand that logic of defining a woman by having the apparatus to give. That's not a lot of women can't have children. And in certain communities where I'm from in Nigeria, if a woman can't bear children, it gives her husband the right to disregard her, to disown her. It strips her of any humanity. And I feel like just exactly what you said. If you define, if that's a defining aspect of a woman, that this, that puts us at more risk and vulnerability of being subject to patriarchy, in my opinion. And then also, feminism is about choice. So if a woman wants to stay at home and look after her kids, she can. It's not about imposing for women to have to go to work. It's given us the choice that we can go to work, but we can also stay at home and raise a family. And furthermore, um, I wanted to point out the fact that the, the current feminist debate it always talks about intersectionality. And I think that it's really disappointing to see the panel not have any intersectionality in the sense that there are no women of colour being represented in this panel. Just firstly, I believe the gentleman at the front actually said it was whether or not they had the capability to make children, but that they, uh, that they had the, uh, the, the apparatus for making children. But uh, my actual question was, uh, why, why do we not hear as much indignation about um, women becoming men? I think uh, the thing that I'm astounded by today that I find very difficult today is how many, um, how much people want to say, as a woman, as a woman this, as a woman I did this, as a woman I feel that. And I am a woman. It's always just been a fact as far as I remember. I can't remember e ever thinking about the fact that I am a woman, particularly, apart from when I was looking for a boyfriend in the first place. <laughs> but, um, 
but I think um, it's, it's, it seems really backward to me that now, um, rather than being getting on with life, doing what we want to do, we have to think about things as a woman. I find that a backward step. And then I also think the other side of this debate, which I find really, really difficult, is how it forces us to, it makes us tongue-tied. Mm -hmm. So we now actually don't even know how to uh, discuss many of these subjects. We're not, there's too many acronyms, too many things that it's hard to know. You need a dictionary <laughs> in front of you all the time. And uh, there's a constant concern that somehow or other, whatever you say, you're going to upset someone. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a very dangerous part of this Okay. non-discussion in a way. Thanks. Just before I come back to the panel, I mean, one of the... I'm using my position as chair here, but one of the things that made me want to do this debate was that, on the one hand, I've always liked some part of the transgender theory or thinking that was that gender was fluid, its initial thinking anyway, because I never liked the idea of being set in either one description or another. I thought, wouldn't it be nice to be a tomboy, whatever kind of way you define yourself. <laughs> On the other hand, and I completely share the, the views that the biological determinism really does not sit well with me at all in relation to certainly defining women. On the other hand, the total disregard for that doesn't work either, because then, as some panelists have said, you kind of completely disregard any either factual reality or fundamental sense of self within um, the sexes. So there's somewhere in between there that perhaps our panellists can come get to. Cathy, pick up on just a few things, only if you've got a minute or two to pick up on something. Um, I'm slightly worried by, I think it came, the first question, it came from the back, sorry, is that there's this sort of rather weird um, um, feminist narrative that clearly young people are being taught at school and university about women have been, whether it's victims or treated as sort of funny feminist objects or they've been shaped by men all their history. It, it really doesn't bear sort of um, um, the evidence. I mean, whether it's Boudicca taking uh, the Brit ancient Britons into war against Rome or whatever, women have always been strong. They've always been out there. They've always defined themselves. This is just an incredibly sort of self-obsessional analysis that all we can talk about in the most affluent country, virtually sixth most affluent country in the world, the most privileged set of people that we all are, and we're just talking about ourselves. I sort of agree with that point. When I grew up, I had, I had three sisters. I, I've never once experienced discrimination. I never, I always did exactly what I wanted to achieve. My, two of my sisters are high-flying career women without children. That was their choice. We all followed our choices. I don't know what the fuss has been about. And now we have this sort of narrative of women being put upon by men throughout history that I think is a, 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 it's, it's a very, very negative and, and poorly um, evidenced narrative. I'm going to begin by saying something that what people say to me hundreds of times a day and each time they say it to me it really makes me groan which is that there isn't one type of feminism and I think intersectional feminism has really been at the heart of supporting the trans ideology and this idea that to be a woman is is just a feeling and a woman can identify as a man a man can identify as a woman actually radical feminists have I think um, been the people who have most defended the concept of what it is to be a woman nowadays and, and actually I salute them for that. I, I'm not a radical feminist myself but I think they do need to be applauded for having been at the forefront of defending what it means to be a woman. My favourite feminist is Simone de Beauvoir and she was the one who famously said one is not born but becomes a woman and you know if we're looking for why have we got to where we are with transgenderism nowadays I actually don't blame feminism for it. Um, I think it's because when we think of that phrase one is not born but becomes a woman I think over the course of the past 20 years in relation to both men and women we've lost all sense of what the word becoming means I've, and again it comes back to this idea of individuals having some control over their own destiny being able to shape consciously their own identity to to shape the becoming themselves so we nobody nowadays has any idea any concept of, of making themselves of, of doing or becoming themselves so either we're a product of our socialization yeah you know, I am how I am because my mother curse her 
put me into a pink baby grove 44 years ago, you know, and that explains the entire course of my life. Um, or I am what I am simply because of my hormones, my genes, my biology, you know, and, and nowhere in those two, you know, it was all the pink baby grow, it's all my DNA and my hormones. Is there an opportunity for us to say, no, I've actually had some agency in shaping the course of my own life. And it's not feminism, it's because we've lost that becoming, um, that capacity to define ourselves that I think we are where we are. You know, in this debate, I always find myself with strange bedfellows. So um, I, probably most people on the panel have uh, a, a broadly similar view to transgenderism as me, but I feel also that I want to distance myself from some of the other views expressed. I, I am a radical feminist, um, and I want to explain what a radical feminist is briefly, if I have the time to do it. I too believe that women are agents in their own right. I too believe that women are not victims. As far as I'm concerned, it's the feminist movement throughout history that has fought for this position. So to say women can do whatever they want, w uh, my gender has never um, bound me to anything, whether that is true or not is probably up for debate in my view. But even being able to ex express that is the result of the brave women who have fought for women to be agents in that way, have fought for gender diversity, who fought for not being constrained by femininity and for men not to be constrained by masculinity. But there is something else going on. It's simply not true that there isn't evidence that women are not, uh, that men are not um, st structurally. Men do commit violence towards women more than women commit violence towards men. It is empirically evidence that there is sexual violence towards women. So the women worried at the moment about the changes to the Gender Recognition Act are not worried, um, are not uh, people who imagine that there are dangers around every single corner. On the contrary, they're very, very brave women, actually, who dare to put their heads above the parapet and say there's something really going wrong in our society at the moment when a man can simply identify, sign a piece of paper, and say, this, say that he is a woman. The consequences of that I could go on about, but I won't because I haven't got time. In relation to um, the question that was just asked, I think, over here by the gentleman over here, which is why isn't there a similar a response to women who identify as men? And the answer to that is quite simple. Um, from my point of view, I don't care whether women identify as men or men identify with women. This isn't, this isn't the issue here. We live in a li liberal democracy and hopefully we can define ourselves in whichever way we want. The problem is once you embed that in the law, once you start telling people how they can describe their bodies, what they can say about their bodies, and even how they can spell the term men or women. The interesting thing is that women who identify as men don't ask that of men. They don't ask men to deny the fact that they have penises that give them pleasure. They don't deny the fact that, uh, they don't ask men to change their, the term men. They, on the whole, they want to get on with just identifying with men, which is really cool as far as I'm concerned. Uh, this demonstrates the level of misogyny, actually, that runs throughout the transgender movement, that men who identify as women are determined to tell women, biological women, that they can't talk about their bodies, that they're equally women as me or anyone else. And so, what the transgender movement is doing at the moment with tra uh, through trans women is demonstrating this terrible word patriarchy, which is a very crude term, and I dislike it myself because it's, it's, um, it's not subtle enough. But in many ways, it, in its simplicity, it does describe something. So just let me say patriarchy for the moment. It demonstrates, the transgender movement at the moment demonstrates that all the equality that we ever got 
has actually transforming itself with a backlash at the moment. And that's why a feminism through individualism will never work because it will open itself to backlashes like this. We have to have a collective structural analysis of what is going on. And, and that um, individualism is great. It would be fantastic if we could just all do what we want to do. But as far as I'm concerned, it has a real naivety embedded within it. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Um, I think we should all be able to talk about our own bodies and each other's bodies. I don't think it's necessarily particularly interesting, but we should have that, uh, that right. Um, on the, 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 the point about um, transgender women or men with uh, penises invading women's spaces, I would like to err uh, on the side of caution a little bit in suggesting that that is a, a danger of that distracting from the main issues here, really, because um, Jermaine Greer, I think, said, well, I've got the quote here, it's not, um, she said, we like to think, oh, the penis is a weapon. No, it isn't. If you want to hurt a man, try hurting him there. Um, <laughs> so, yeah. Um, the I, I want to come back uh, primarily, though, to this point, question about what is the biological bottom line? And coming back to Joanna's um, reference to de Simone de Beauvoir, I agree Simone de Beauvoir was a brilliant writer and thinker, but I think the essence of her, uh, her point that a woman is socially constructed, I, I won't actually bore you with the exact quote, the most quoted um, uh, thing in feminism, um, but she was describing her society as it was in that time. France in the 1940s, when she wrote that book, women couldn't even vote. Um, and she was describing a situation in which um, you, w you were deemed to become less a woman the less you accepted feminine roles, the less you accepted the constraints that were imposed on you. So paradoxically, the biological determinist argument that says everything about men and women and how they behave is all there biologically in the genes and the brains and all of that, that was a socially, socially constructed um, agenda. The biological bottom line, however, is absolutely minimal. Uh, beyond the obvious, we do have to figure out how we, uh, as a society, as different societies, how we organise reproduction. But, as um, Sandy on the front uh, bench put it brilliantly, I think, it is a, a bottom line. And it is not that you have to be fertile. If, you can't get, if, you, if you're not capable of, of, of having children, that makes you less a woman. That is exactly what the argument that I'm uh, uh, saying and, and what, what I think feminism did really well is, is saying exactly the opposite. It's saying that it is how you are perceived to appear to have that um, equipment. That is a bottom line, and it doesn't need to go anywhere beyond where you want it to go and where the constraints of society also. I'm not saying that we are all completely free to do whatever we want. We are free within the society in which we live. And we have to emphasize that freedom and that choice above all else. Um, it seems to me that political naivete is demolishing liberalism at the moment. The way that ideologies work is they problematize whole areas of life so that the solutions to those problems can then be sold to us. And so, I think this is happening across a whole range of issues, uh, from Me Too, which naturalizes male predatory sexual nature and makes it seem essential, so that then we can sort of sell women this idea that they need gender segregated spaces, maybe train carriages, maybe even modesty dress. Likewise, um, a solution to you know ubiquitous racism. It's everywhere, isn't it? And yet. Doesn't that conflict with the fact that the taboo of racism is as colossal as it's ever been? Uh, there, are these realities or are these just myths that are being sold to us so that we will buy the solutions which give privileges to groups that don't yeah. presently have them? Exactly. That's the first thing. Secondly, um, I grew up in the 1970s and I came from a very conservative culture where television, movies, religion divided men and women into very separate stereotype personalities, not just sexes. As a kid, the way I behaved, if the diagnosis existed back then, I would have been a trans kid. I wanted to be a boy, not a girl. I wanted to play American football. 
I wanted to do all the things that only little boys were meant to do. My mom, God bless her, was a progressive, liberal thinking person, and she didn't think that because I wanted to do those things, I must have a male brain in my body, and I must really be a boy, and therefore I need to be fixed. No, society was what needed to be addressed, a society that was too narrow about what a woman or a man could be. Thank God. Nowadays, though, if I were that kid, I would, basically, I'm a lesbian. But no, I would do the non-progressive solution. Instead of being a lesbian, sleeping with women, because women can do that too, no, I would be diagnosed with a disease. But is it my disease or is it society's disease? Thank you. Very good. Very interesting. Obviously, at the minute, the UK and sort of globally as well is sort of suffering with a mental health crisis and whether this sort of in sort of indecisiveness about whether you identify as a man or a woman, if that is if that is causing young people and people in general to sort of self-harm and commit suicide because they don't feel accepted. So has this sort of question about what is a woman caused the mental health crisis in a certain... Hello there, hi. Um, I'm curious to know what the panel thinks uh, about some of the influences of maybe the 20th century, the century of the self, as it's been called, mm -hmm. on younger generations, people younger than myself, 30, who are at the moment in a state of crisis about the self, about identity, about purpose in life, and whether or not there's this sense that if you can just conceive of yourself as a persona or an, or an identity frozen in time on which forces that are adverse to your existence are constantly acting, then you can relieve yourself of the terrifying prospect of having to act first in life and mm. practice and develop yourself before yes. you know exactly what you are, which is a very scary thing. Mm. But the, the narcissism that was mentioned at the beginning of the panel mm. and some of the other phenomena that have been sort of, you know, I think encapsulated by the selfie, mm. this idea of just being and not having to act further and become something. I'd like to know what the panel thinks about this. Thank you. Um, yeah, as the kind of question of socialization has started to come up in the course of this discussion, um, I'd like to kind of straight out ask the panel if they think there should be any kind of protections for children in relation to their gender identity because, um, you know, the question of conversion therapy, how it's applied, how it might impact the development of someone's relationship to their gender, I think is actually a really important issue for society to be able to discuss in an open and complicated manner. Do you think that the value of a woman has been devalued so much that anybody can just decide that today I'm going to be a woman and then tomorrow I'm going to be a man and then they can decide whether or not they're a man or a woman than just having their own, just being themselves rather than just identifying as a man or a woman? Um, I'm very interested in the fact that uh, the one thing that is sort of causing a, quite a lot of tension in the, the comments is uh, are those the issue of maternity and reproductive mm capacity, the equipment, mm. as Sandy kind of, I don't know, <laughs> I'm not sure of that, that phrase. But it is true that, that uh, uh, reproduction, uh, which certainly objectively seems to be linked to most women, I mean, obviously some women can't and so on, mm. a, a, a young lady up there says some people cannot have, have children and so on. But the reality is that uh, in the West, in the industrial world, people are having less and exactly, less children. Exactly, that's what I said. The experience of being productive mm. or producing other yes, human beings true is becoming an increasingly un well, mm. not unusual, but certainly a, a not as common and not as early mm. uh, for women as it was a mm. generation ago and certainly two generations mm. ago. So there, what is very apparent is there is very kind of clear uh, uh, confusion about mm. subjective aspects mm. of femininity and womanhood mm. or identity, uh, which are partly arbitrary, mm. f uh, fluid, uh, mm. self-determining and mm. so on, and more material uh, mm. debates uh, mm. around how society organizes uh, uh, what, what uh, mm. uh, was described as the sex class of being a woman. Now, that's, that's a, and the social organization mm. of being that sex class. I mean, obviously, if, if you had a society which was matriarchal and celebrated mm. Mm. Uh, the having of children, mm. it would be a very different society. The reality is that if we have, we, we think we have choice, or women have choice about mm. Their, mm. how they run their lives, but in the end, the mm. process of having children uh, does impact on what 
mm. then happens to you mm. later, because not because of your bad or good choice, but because mm. of the way society yeah. organizes the business of mm. reproducing. And I, I haven't heard enough very much on, from the panel on those okay. kinds of issues. Yep. Um, I'm wondering whether the panel think a similar discussion is going on uh, amongst men. So are men asking what it means to be a man? Do you think that yes. men feel their masculinity mm, yes. and their sense of identity threatened by trans people who identify as men? Um, so mm. is this just a problem that's partly caused by feminism? Is it a debate that's happening just among Huge women? Or do men feel the same about this problem? I just want to come back to the, um, the thing about entrenching stereotypes because that is part of the problem. When, when, if we um, focus on the idea that transgender women, transsexual women, um, are always about pulling the stereotypes over to its most feminine aspect, we miss one of the more troubling um, um, developments, which is that... Um, this, I have to go back a little bit into history here, but when this started to become a big debate, not in the mainstream, but in, um, um, in academia and, and in uh, radical circles, the argument that the radical feminists had was exactly that, that these are men who are trying to teach women how to be women, and that is repressing and oppressing us. Uh, and the trans women came back to that argument and said, actually, no, we're only doing what society says we have to do in order to fil fulfill our inner need to be women. And in actual fact, we would much rather just be women in the, in, in, in the way that we choose to be. We would rather actually be women without having to wear all the makeup and the wigs and, um, and uh, all the surgery and all the rest of it, which is where you then end up with the radical seeming argument, the gender queer argument, that um, men who are exactly like men in every ordinary way of understanding it can actually be women. And that is supposed to sort of be liberating. And it's simply, it isn't liberating for the main reason, the primary, primary reason that most common experience simply does not work like that. It just, it's just completely sort of um, antagonistic to ordinary people who experience life the way we do. Um, I think that there isn't a crisis of masculinity in relation to the challenge that trans men, i.e. women who identify as men, are making to men. I think they're largely unconcerned about that. I don't think a man is in the changing room is particularly bothered whether there's a female-bodied person in there tr trying on male clothes. I think there is a, I don't know whether it's a crisis, we were always talking about crises and I'm not sure whether it's the right word, but I think men will be reflecting upon themselves at the moment, but I think, and that's fine, and it's not something I particularly uh, want, I don't enjoy the idea that men are uncomfortable, but this, this discussion is in danger of, of doing what normally happens i.e. that men are in danger, they're, they're, they're in a crisis, and that feminism is to blame. This is such a, a crude way of understanding, in my view, what is going on in the culture at the moment. So, you know, whilst I want to accept that men are possibly in crisis, the word that I'll use, I certainly don't accept that it's feminism that's done it. The, the feminism which I identify with is very... Um, willing and wanting men not to be bound by rigid stereotypes. It's the opposite, in fact. So to get back to the, just, the, I know we, we need to move on, just the, the birth thing. Obviously, um, how women give birth, whether they should give birth, whether they want to, whether they can, all of these aspects of it are, are absolutely embedded in the culture. There is no such thing as giving birth naturally as it were outside or having medical interventions all of these aspects of all of our biological lives are continuously lived within culture and that culture changes and we'll feel differently about it depending on 50 years from now or 50 years backwards I just want to end this point by saying that i sincerely hope that people haven't heard me say Anything that's biologically essential about women, that was not my argument at all. I ended by saying what we need to do 
is be grown ups and think through the relationship between biology and culture. And we haven't done enough of that. Thank you. Cathy, do you want to bring in anything? Oh, very, very, yes, very quickly. Yes, men. Nobody talks about men. Um, we always talk about women. Women bore on about women for bloody ever. You know, it gets a bit much. Out there, there are loads of men who've been pro providers and protectors, who've got killed in wars, who are now losing their jobs, who are being marginalised in society. As female work rates go up, that's not necessarily a bad thing, I'm saying, but male rates have gone down. The people whose suicide rates are going up, the men, nobody is interested in men. And yes, they are in a crisis, and they're big men's movements if any women bothered to look on the internet they'd find that the international men's conference no journalists bothered to attend do you think an international women's conference nobody would attend to go back i thought your point was very interesting about society and about children and about um um, you, you said uh, you're at the ideology is problematizing something, selling it as a myth uh, so that we'll buy into the solutions or a particular grievance group. This is grievance politics all over. This is the hierarchy of victimhood. You're right. It's unhealthy. It's bad. Now, we want to find out why if society is unhealthy and too much. So identity politics is unhealthy. Grievance politics are unhealthy. Resentment is unhealthy. These are all mentally unhealthy. What we've had is in place of religion, in place of faith, in place of the things that Christianity told us about altruism, we have um, the religion of political correctness. It's a poor substitute for our mental health. Okay, I'm... Very, very quickly, first of all, on should protections be in place? Should we <coughs> ban conversion therapy or something like that? Um, I'm not going to argue in favour of anything like that, but one thing that does concern me greatly is how now, the trans movement, particularly in schools, is actually undercutting the authority of parents. Yeah. And I think that is a very dangerous and very troubling um, move. And I think parents should be able to have a say over whether their children change their name or whatever it is during the school course of the school day. Uh, secondly, on the points that were made over here, one thing I think is very, very interesting is that uh, you look at the statistics, there's far more adolescent girls transitioning to become boys uh, than the other way around. And I said at the, um, in my opening remarks, I thought the category of woman was being erased. I actually think far more to the point the category of being a lesbian is being completely erased nowadays. And it does strike me that, um, you know, as a child, a girl, when you grow up, up until the age of kind of 10, 12, being a tomboy can be yeah, quite an absolutely. attractive thing to be, but hit adolescence. And then for a boy, being a gay man can equally be kind of not attractive, maybe the wrong word, but there are certainly positive role models for being a gay Why man being a lesbian woman is something which I think is seen as being a much more challenging thing for young girls to take on board that identity. And so transitioning then to become a boy actually seems like a, a far more straightforward option, which I think is deeply alarming. Um, I think, you know, final comment on this. I, I agree with people who've been saying, actually, we need to move beyond gender. You know, we need to be able to experiment. We need to free up and expand human potential Exactly. not in these gender categories mm -hmm. and I know we've had a lot of to and throwing about you know to what extent do we blame feminism is feminism not to has, has feminism challenge this you know I do one thing I do blame feminism for is because it bloody forces us to look at everything through the prism of gender you know pay mm -hmm. jobs parenting everything we're told to look at it through this lens of yeah. gender and it's boring and it's yeah. meaningless nowadays and and yeah I'll leave it <laughs> If I accept my biology as either a man or a woman, what should I then do in relation to developing my character? Should I be asking myself, yeah, how can important. I be the best man I can be? Or should I be asking myself, how can I be the best individual that I can be? So I, I get the sense that most of the panel agree that we should move beyond gender. But I just wonder, I'm a school teacher, about the sort of practicalities. Do you think there's a limit to how limit for how education schools and institutions can actually um, kind of treat children equally mm -hmm. so just could you comment on the practical uh, what you think about the practicality so things like toilets sports teams um, in my school we have sort of interventions for boys who are underachieving that sort of thing uh, just a very quick point I just want to take it away from biology and gender politics and just talk about um, role models and I think um, I grew up in the 90s where there was the Ladette culture and you could, you, know, you could basically act however you wanted. And I see now that the role models for young girls are the Kardashians, it's, yes. you know, it's Geordie Shaw, 
it's it's girls who are they don't have to achieve anything it's it's reality stars and i just yeah. wanted to make the point that what is a woman is is you know it's mm. it's, it's a media portrayal that's that's yeah. driving some of that to what extent would you say that the modern idea that um, women are put upon by men is just another conspiracy theory for example i mean white supremacists in the us might say uh, all the troubles we have in our lives as white men is caused by blacks, Cubans, and Jews. And in a way, when Serena Williams says, all my troubles in tennis, and people say my job prospects are hindered by men, and they blame this on men, this might just be another conspiracy theory. So I want to hear your views on that. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so it just come, seems that most of this comes down to what the law actually says, rather than what we think, which we, I think we're all agreed is a bit more personal. So the question really is, is there anything specific or we think the law should distinguish between men and women. So it's, it's touching upon what someone said on the panel earlier about how there is not uh, a consensus among trans people. Um, and I agree with Heather, actually, that there is a lot of misogyny and silencing of women around the trans issue, and that uh, a lot of trans people actually disagree with this and condemn this. So we're kind of stuck in a, between a rock and a hard place, you know, people like you who would have me in a men's prison and people in the trans community who would denigrate me for disagreeing with them and for saying that they're misogynist. So where does it leave people like us who do believe in equality, do believe in uh, misogyny and feminism, but are also trans and oppressed? So it's quite difficult for people like us. Thank you. Um, so I haven't heard anyone mention like the term turf yet. Um, and things like that I hear like, uh, like held a lot of people on either side of the argument who, you know, t like raise any questions. Um, to me, like debates like this are invaluable. And I think that like um, those kind of terms are the, like pejorative insults to people. Like um, it can really close down debates. Do you think it does? And if it does, how can we like combat that? Um, this is actually a very practical point, kind of echoing, echoing the teacher at the back. Um, I work in uh, women's mental health, and I just, I would, I'd like to know what are the ramifications for these sorts of debates about women's space, um, safe spaces. So one of the discussions about being about transgender people working in domestic violence services, transgender people working in rape, but I kind of want to see how this debate plays out and the kind of practicalities of life and where, where we stand on that. I was interested in the bit of the debate where we started to talk about the business of reproduction. Somebody down at the front right talked about the business of reproduction, which just made me think and reflect on this. The other word that we've had is, is narcissism. And I'm just wondering, is there any link, do you think, between all these different shades of pink and blue, all this self-obsession with what shade we are today, and narcissism, and the fact that people are having less children now? Because with this level of narcissism, we can't actually attend to the children, can we? Yeah. <laughs> I, I just want to ask a question of the panel. The GRA consultation ends on Friday. Um, do are the Radfems have they lost the battle already? Hi, it's just, it's just a point of, of clarification. Really, the business about the um, means of reproduction, where it comes from historically, is uh, in fact it was plagiarised from Karl Marx by the radical feminists Shul Shulamith Firestone and various others. And what it came down to is Karl Marx divided the world into two societies: ruling class and working class and said one has the means of production and one controls it. So the feminists just effectively plagiarized it and defined women as the some people with the means of reproduction or the business of reproduction, if somebody likes, and said effectively it's controlled by, uh, controlled by men. And uh, so effectively that's really all it came down to. So it's, it's, it's a, um, it, it's in some ways, it's a biological person, uh, a view, but because they claim that they're oppressed by the means of reproduction, that's why they also claim that it's non-biological essentialist. Ultimately, it doesn't really stack up. But, um, you know, so for example, powerful women uh, in society would be denied, or in some ways as a woman, if you turn around and, and accept uh, the view that, um, that women uh, are, are subordinated in society to men, which is the radical feminist view. Yeah, I, ju I just want to say that I think that um, sorry, yeah, that the that the reforms to the Gender Recognition Act are going to um, make various ethnic groups feel much more alienated from mainstream British society because the idea that women aren't women is going to be um, very very difficult from for people from um, other countries, and it's not just you know it's not going to further integration. In recent years, a lot of children have chosen to become trans, but do you think parents should allow this, knowing that children are really indecisive? As a young girl, I was always, I always heard this metaphor, oh, you run like a girl, 
you do this like a girl. It's this common stereotype I think that women today face and I don't understand where this stereotype came from or why this stereotype was developed at su such a young age. Can I please hear your thoughts on this? Thank you. I think one of the things that really concerns me about the whole transgender and the women debate is um, what it's doing to language and we saw the sort of women uh, with the X from the Welcome uh, collection this week but then there's also the issue with pronouns and uh, as a linguist I have a big problem with the whole they them mm. pronoun situation I can't talk to someone seriously as a plural um, and uh, you know I just wondered I, it's always worrying to me when when a campaign has an effect on language and what we can and can't say and I just wanted to hear some of the panel's views on that. Uh, it's been a fantastic debate. I wanted to have a debate about what it means to be a woman. We've spent most of the time talking about the transgender issue and what it means to be transgender in relation to women. I think that's a very interesting observation to have in relation to this. Can we really still talk about womanhood if there is such a thing uh, without getting hooked up in this debate? But nevertheless, I'd the kick us off. Okay. Um, I think the reason why feminists bang on, as Joanne said, about gender so much is because gender has taken on so much significance in our society and I think it is self-indulgent, I think it is narcissistic, I think we've become obsessed with gender. That's why feminists bang on about it because they don't want gender to be rigid in that way. They want, gen they want fluidity, they want to in fact get rid of the term gender. It would be great if we could just get rid of this term gender identity and then we could be what we want to be without defining ourselves as running like a girl or behaving like a boy. Oh, the really serious thing that's going on in our culture at the moment, which I haven't touched upon and is what I'm centrally concerned about, is the issue of transgendering children. I think it is extremely problematic. I think it's child abuse. Children should be allowed to be and express themselves in whichever way they want to. Yeah. Gender has become so rigidified now, more, more so now than ever, I think, in terms of pink for girls, blue for boys, what a boy should be and what a girl should be. So my rallying cry would be let's look after the children, let's free the children, let's get rid of the notion of gender identity, allow people to be the biological sex they are and realise that whatever biological sex you are, you can be whoever you want to be. Thank you. Yeah. Um, on the, the question, why is it that we are getting so many more girls that want to become trans men than the other way around? I'm not sure what the reason is, but if it were the case, if it were the case that these were girls who wanted to aspire to masculine values, who wanted to be brave and courageous and rational and get to grips with rebuilding society and making us all uh, much, much better off, then that would be great. There would be something good within that. But the point is, and this, is, this really, really does get to the, the, the bottom of it, is that these are not people who see masculinity in that sort of old-fashioned, positive way. What I want is for that type of masculinity to be human uh, aspirational uh, identity. I want us all to be what used to be called masculine. <laughs> Right, all those questions. Um, Heather, real firm point of agreement. What's happening with children is, uh, is near um, abuse. It is abuse. Um, children are not developed. Their brains aren't developed. Their bodies aren't developed. Being, putting children on hormones to, to stop their um, maturity at puberty is nigh on wicked. I don't know how it's happening. Go back to the schools. I think one thing I feel very strongly about, there should be girls and boys lose in schools. I think I've been into schools where there's no, no safe... That's my safe space. I don't believe in the safe space theory. But boys and girls do need separate spaces. So this unigender thing in school I find offensive. I don't like it. Um, and I think teaching children about gender from nursery school, infant school upwards is quite ridiculous. It, it shouldn't even be on their thoughts. They should be just being allowed to be children, which comes to the fact of why don't we spend more time at school and everywhere talking about what it is, as the young gentleman said, about what it is to be a person, to be a good person. And you were saying, do we say it as a man or woman? I was always taught it was me as a person, how to be a good person. The only time I gendered it or sexed it was how to be a good mother or how to be a good father but beyond the thing of my maternity 
and my looking after children. My moral code is how to be a decent person. Thank you, Kathy. Just uh, three very quick points. Firstly, on schools and practicalities, I completely agree that adolescent girls should have um, changing rooms, toilets that are single sex, that are exclusive to girls. My big concern, share with Cathy, share with others on the panel, is that schools are actually being used as a vehicle for socialisation um, around gender. When four-year-olds are asked to choose what gender they are, I think that creates all kinds of problems. And it, again, my big concern is that it actually overrides parental authority in this area. Um, somebody asked a question down here about, well, do, do we need any gender-specific laws? Um, I think some pretty paraphrasing the question very badly there but actually I do think we we do need some gender specific laws and I think women do need um, enshrined in law access to abortion um, in order to be able to take a full part in society I think the right to abortion um, the right to contraception on demand was a very important demand to the original feminist movement and I think it's still an important I think that needs to be defended today uh, final thought you know, I've got three children. I actually think it's, sorry, apologies to the one who's sitting in the room right now, um, but I actually think it is the least interesting thing about me. And I think, <laughs> sorry, but uh, the one who's in the room is wonderful. But I think there's far more about me, about me as a woman, than simply the fact of, of motherhood. And I, I really would think it would be rather tragic if we reduce being a woman to motherhood. Yes, motherhood's important. Yes, motherhood is a part of being a woman, but that's it, it's a part of. And being a woman is about so much more um, on top and besides being a mother. Thank you.